Hey there once again guys. Now before I start, don't forget to use the parts section in the description box below since this video is probably going to be quite long for you guys. As you probably already know, my name is Ben Ferriolo and I'm all for the responsible and accurate seismic monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. Along with my YouTube channel, I also maintain a website. A link is provided in the description box below right under my email address. It can teach you how to find, access, and analyze seismic and GPS data, how to read and understand the many different types of seismic plots and charts people use, and it even includes many seismic plots and images regarding many seismic swarms and events. In today's video, we're going to talk about Hawaii just real quick, about those deep, long-period, high-frequency events that have been occurring more frequently lately, at least it seems that way. And I will also be talking about Newberry Caldera Volcano in Oregon. Now, if you live in Bend or Lapine, Oregon, then you probably know about Paulina Lake. Those two lakes inside that crater that aren't too far from you, those are two caldera lakes which reside in a still, very large, active volcano. Now, of course, Newberry is not active in the sense that it is erupting, but it still has an active magma chamber and experiences low-frequency events every now and then. However, the past year or two, it seems those low-frequency events have been increasing at Newberry. Especially recently, when multiple ones occurred just yesterday, guys. I will get into that in just a moment. And here we are on my Hawaii blog. Go to my website. Again, a link is in the description box below under my email address. Go to Seismic Events drop-down menu and click Hawaii, and it will bring you to the blog. I just want to let you guys know that I do have a recent blog post about the deep, long-period, high-frequency events that occurred on March 30th. Now... A link, again, to this right here. This article is in the description box below. I gather the data from four select seismic stations all across the Big Island of Hawaii to show you just how quick and how far these events traveled. I wholeheartedly believe that these long-period events, which carry mid- to high-range frequencies and can last anywhere from 15 minutes to almost an hour, are connected in some way to deep magma transport along the pre-existing conduit that rests near the epicenters at these depths. Also, these events occur primarily between 30 kilometers and 50 kilometers in depth, so that's another reason. Now, these are one of the most interesting seismic events I have ever had the chance to study. Now, I've studied meteor air bursts, rock bursts, mine collapses, nuclear explosions, quarry blasts, surface events such as a large truck passing by, volcanic earthquakes and tremor, volcanic explosions and eruptions, and many, 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 many other odd and strange events that are not just typical earthquakes. But these events here are definitely one of the most interesting events I have ever had the pleasure of studying. Okay, so now we have some of the volcanic monitoring data for Kilauea and Mauna Loa and the surrounding volcanoes on the Big Island of Hawaii. Down here we have PPLD. Now the epicenter of these deep, long period, high frequency events is used to be out here, right under here, around 30 kilometers to 50 kilometers in depth. Now, they are occurring much closer to the coast, still occurring between 30 kilometers and 50 kilometers in depth, but it seems to be getting closer to the island, which I thought was interesting. Let's go to Seismic Station PPLD for the past 24 hours. Looky, looky. Since March 30th, on, on March 30th, 2019, there were three events, which again, I did write about in that article. Again, a link is below in the description box. Looks like on PPLD, we are seeing two more events. Notice we have one right here, around 2200 UTC, April 1st. Then we have a second one down here. Notice this. I believe USGS is reporting some of them. Hold on one second. Let's go to a distant seismic station to see if we see the same thing. Yes, we do. Around 2200, we see a long period event right there. And around here, around 657 UTC, we see another long period event here. Let's check the most distant station all the way up here. Well, not the most distant station, but one of them near Mauna Kea. Past 24 hours, we see right here, there's a slightly long period event, and we see the 657 UTC one down here. Okay, so we know those are real seismic events because they're showing up on stations all across the Big Island of Hawaii from the southern portion to the northern portion. So we know those are real. Now I want to go to the latest earthquakes just real quick. Let's go to Hawaii. Now, what I like to keep my eye out for are deep earthquakes occurring near Pahala, Hawaii, occurring between 30 kilometers and 50 kilometers in depth. Obviously, they could probably get a little deeper than that. They could probably be a little more shallow than that, but that's primarily the range that these events have been occurring. 
In the past, USGS has labeled them as other event, and that can be seen on multiple of my blog posts that I uh, write and show data for for these events. But recently, they have just been simply labeling, labeling them earthquakes, which I don't think is a good idea because these are not just earthquake events, guys. These are definitely long period events, but with higher frequencies, which is probably why USGS and HVO still or used to label them as other event because they're confusing, guys. These events don't even make any sense, really. Okay, so for this event right here, let's go back to PPLD, the closest seismic station to these events that are occurring down here. Now, if we go to the past 24 hours, why did it not open? That's not cool. There we go. Past 24 hours, remember around 2200 UTC on April 1st? hope I didn't say March 1st earlier in the video, but April 1st. Um, they're not reporting anything. And you'll see in just a second that this was real. I mean, you obviously saw it on multiple seismic stations across Hawaii. I'm going to show this in the program swarm in a minute. But they are reporting some events for right here. Here, Let me go to Mauna Loa, which actually is PLAD shows these events a little bit stronger for some weird reason. There we go. This looks a little better. Okay, so they are reporting an event at 258, a deep earthquake, 2.2 kilometers in depth. Well, not too deep. Occurring at 31.6 kilometers in depth, but still a little bit deeper than normal. Let's see, and that was at 258 UTC. 258 UTC. That would be this one right here. Notice how it is not a deep long period high frequency event. That's why you got to be careful. Some of these deep long period high frequency events are labeled as earthquakes, but it, there are also deep earthquakes actually occurring that are separate from the process that creates the deep long period high frequency events. Okay, so. 657, 2.8 at 40.7 kilometers in depth this is at 657. Notice there's the 7 UTC mark right here. 657 would be right about, right about here. So they're saying it starts right about here. That doesn't make much sense. Don't see anything there. 659 UTC at 2.8 at 38.7 kilometers in depth, shallowing. Notice how it's shallowing. So that means this right here. But notice, you can see a whole long period event occurring long before that. So we know that this is also multiple earthquakes occurring along with a background tremor that contains dominant frequencies that can reach 9.7 hertz. But recently, the recent events seem to be a little bit higher than that, going to about 10.3 hertz. So why don't we go look at these two events right here, the one that occurred about 22 UTC and the one that occurred about 7 UTC or so. Uh, let's go take a look at that in the Seismic Program Swarm. Here we are in the Seismic Program Swarm. Let me turn Persistent Rescale off. Overlap set to 95. We do not need a frequency filter right now. Remember around, let's see, around 22 UTC, we see the first event. Remember, these two events did show in multiple stations across the Big Island of Hawaii, like I showed a little bit earlier. But we're just looking at the characteristics. Yes, this is another deep, long period, high frequency event. Notice multiple earthquakes likely do take place during the deep events, these deep long period events. But you can obviously tell, notice that there is something else occurring that is not an earthquake. And sometimes it's emergent and sometimes it all of a sudden starts out of nowhere. <clears throat> so it is strange um, that some are emergent and some are not. Notice the dominant frequency right here. Let's check it out where it peaks, where it peaks and goes downhill. Nope. And there we go. So it peaks and goes downhill at about 9.7 hertz. Actually, more about 10 hertz, I'm going to say. That's when it starts to go down. And you can also see that on the seismic program, or excuse me, on the spectrogram right here. Ends at about 10 hertz. And then weaker frequencies go on above that, of course. So we did have another DLPHF event, guys. That, that is uh, what I am naming them. That is my name for them. And really, the name fits perfectly. I mean, it fits the characteristics perfectly. So let's check right here. Okay, so we do have another one. Remember, some of these are reported as earthquakes by USGS. They used to be labeling them as, quote-unquote, other event in their catalog. But lately, they've just been reporting them as earthquakes. God knows why. Okay, so I'm going to cut the amplitudes just real quick. Just so we can bring out the background tremor just a little bit. Just so you can see the whole thing. There it is. And remember, the amplitudes are not great, guys. The amplitudes are not crazy. So these are weak events. I mean, but they're occurring very deep, though. So whatever's going on down there may not be able to release as much energy back up 
through the conduit into uh, into the ground. I don't know. I'm not a professional, guys. I'm not a professional, at least not yet. And we see the same characteristics here. Look at this. It starts to weaken at about 10.1 hertz. So basically the same exact characteristics as the event right here and all other previous DLPHF events. Notice this one started at about 654 UTC and ended at about 709 UTC. That is a short, short one. That's one of the shortest ones I've ever seen, guys. A um, few of the events on March 30th lasted almost 53, the longest event on March 30th, actually, lasted 53 minutes. So these can last anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to all the way to almost an hour, guys. And it, it all depends on the process that's taking place. A few other quakes have been occurring around uh, Hawaii, Kilauea area, Mauna Loa. Uh, but nothing too crazy, nothing too crazy right now, and so we are going to keep an eye on this. But let's move on to a different volcano, which I really am going to start pointing my attention towards. It's called the Newberry Caldera Volcano. Alright guys, so something did just happen in Hawaii. Just as of the past few minutes ago, they're gone. They reported the earthquakes and they are gone. Uh, okay, so... We just had a bunch of automatic earthquakes appear on Hawaii, like five or six of them, guys, like 2.8, 2.0, 2.5. And by the way, I just finished making my video. Even though this section you're seeing right here is appearing in the center of the video, it's been many minutes since I finished the entire video. I, I had to put this in here because I just saw multiple, multiple red dots. I'm going to refresh the page because I don't know why they disappeared. Go back to latest earthquakes. And let's see, let's go to Hawaii. Let's go to Hawaii, shall we? And no, they are not reporting them at all. Okay, so we just saw, uh, not on this video, sadly, multiple, multiple red dots did appear. So I was like, oh my god, another deep long period high frequency event. Go to the Kilauea page, and look, past 12 hours, we do have another deep long period high frequency event coming in just in the past few minutes. It's probably still ongoing, still has not ended yet. Let's look at another distant station. Here's the past six hours. Yes, we have another deep, long period, high frequency event coming in. As of 12.38 p.m. Pacific time, April 2nd, 2019, they just were reporting them with red dots, and now they're not. They took them away. Wow. Hopefully they put them back up, guys. I really hope they do. And let's take a look at them, the Seismic Program Swarm right now, the most recent one. Okay, so these are the two events I just analyzed, right? These are the two events right here. Well, I just downloaded an even more recent data stream for PPLD, and we do see another deep long period high frequency event is occurring as I speak right now at 1239 or 1240 p.m. Pacific time, uh, April 2nd, 2019. It is still ongoing. It is still happening as I speak. But I just want to zoom out and take a look at this real quick. Although it's not, actually, it looks like it's almost over. Uh, let's check out the spectra. Yeah, it looks like it's still ongoing, but it is now starting to die down. It lasted multiple minutes. Here's the most recent data stream right here. Started at about 1914 UTC on April 2nd, and is still ongoing. So it's lasting probably, I'm going to say, maybe 25 to 35 minutes maximum. Uh, let's check it out. Going up to about 1,000 amplitude count with the highest spike right here, but most of the activity remains about... 330 to 400 amplitude count or so. This one is not too large again, but still, it was a good-sized one. Uh, Hawaii was reporting multiple. They had multiple red dots appear. That's what made me uh, look at the online web recorders. Multiple red dots appeared. And then all of a sudden, I go back to the earthquake map, and they're gone. But I looked on the heli quarters, and uh, it looks like it's happening, guys. We do have another deep, long period, high-frequency event. Again, you can see multiple earthquake spikes, but then there is another background tremor. This one peaks at about 10.1 hertz, and weaker frequencies go beyond that, of course. But that's what we see as usual. Another one, guys. So these deep long period uh, high frequency events are not stopping. They're not stopping. It's still continuing. Is this going to lead to another eruption, or what is going to happen because of this? Obviously, these are not normal, and these should not be happening. So what is taking place to cause these events? I don't know. So let's move on. All right. So here's the reported seismicity for Newberry Caldera. Only 14 reported earthquake events since January 1st of this year to right now, which is 11.51 a.m. April 2nd, 2019. Okay, now 14 is very low. However, I do believe Newberry is one of the next volcanoes to reawaken. Now, I have no idea when that will be, and there's no exact sign of that right now. 
these low frequency events could be, which we'll get into that in just a second. And that is just a personal opinion of mine. Just know there are some earthquakes and possible tremor that was not reported for Newberry during this time period. Not only did I detail this on my Cascade Volcanoes Low Frequency Events page, which I will show in just a second, but I also detailed this in one of my older videos from a few months back. Note the recent seismicity just in the past day or so. Notice April 1st, April 1st, April 1st, April 1st, uh, March 31st, March 29th, March 26th, March 16th. Look at that. And then February 13th, January 30th, January 26th, 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 and then January 2nd. Okay, guys. So, very interesting. So, most of the seismicity since January 1st of this year has been just in the past few days, actually. Um, so, let's move on to something else real quick. I'm still talking about Newberry. Don't worry. Let's go to the PNSN catalog just real fast. Okay, so how do I know the recent earthquakes at Newberry called there are of the low frequency variety? How do I know that? Well, on PNSN.org, they do have an awesome tool, and sometimes they remove events, which I'm not happy about. I don't like it when they remove events. Um, maybe if it's for a good reason, like maybe they thought it was a low frequency event, but it was an explosion, but these are not explosions, guys. These are real low frequency earthquakes and or tremor. So go to PNSN.org, go to earthquakes. Go to custom search, which is where we are right here. Now I want you to notice something. Press all for the magnitude. Press depths for the, or excuse me, press all for the dates. For latitude, longitude, press all. For depth, press all. Have everything set to all except event type. Make sure event type is unchecked. Notice it has multiple event types and local events. We don't want that. We don't want explosions. Right now, we do not want unknown, and we do not want regional. We want low frequency. Notice that? It says low frequency. This will show only low frequency events and events that have been confirmed by PNS and to be low frequency events, either low frequency earthquake, low frequency tremor, things like that. So, let's press query and search. Okay. Notice, let me put it in UTC. Okay. April 1st, April 1st, April 1st, uh, March 31st, March 26th, February 13th. So we've had a good amount of low frequency events as of late, guys. So we see the recent events reported by USGS are characterized as low frequency events by the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. This is obvious. Now, now, real quick, what is the importance of low frequency events? Well, low frequency earthquakes or tremor can be caused by a multitude of processes and actually have been seen near tectonic areas nowhere near a volcano but these types of low frequency events are likely especially right underneath a volcanic caldera are likely connected to either two things gas release like newberry's farting and it's reverberating up through the cracks or the actual movement of magma itself and we'll get into that in just a second. Now, this is obvious when taking a look at the waveforms and the frequency content of these events, which we will do in just a minute. Please note that the most recent LF events are much shallower than they used to be. Please note the depths since February 13th. Don't look at February 13th. That one's deeper at 9 kilometers. But look at the ones from just March and April, March 26th, 31st, and then April 1st, April 1st, April 1st. Look at this, 1.7 kilometers in depth, negative 0.6. No, that does not mean it occurred above the caldera. Because remember, the caldera is a good few thousand feet above sea level, guys. So that's definitely still underground, but very shallow, just right under the caldera. Then 1.6 kilometers in depth and 0.9, then 1.1. But then if you look at the older ones, February 13th or December 23rd of last year, December 22nd, December 22nd, uh, yeah, 9.0 kilometers in depth, 8.1 kilometers in depth, 10.5 kilometers in depth. So we have all these deeper events. And this one right here, this 23.4 kilometers in depth, which occurred on November 30th, 2017. This one is likely to be an actual DLP, a deep long period event. Not like the one seen in Hawaii, don't worry. Um, but notice how they are much deeper. But then all of a sudden, around late March to just yesterday, April 1st, we see an increase in LF events, a good burst, a good sized burst in low frequency earthquakes at a shallow depth that previously has not been seen before. Interesting. So, please note again that the LF events are much shallower than they used to be. Apparently, the magma system is anywhere from 1 kilometers below sea level to 6 kilometers below sea level. Please note again the older ones, ending so far with the LF events on February 13th of this year, were much deeper and occurred possibly below the magma chamber. 
Could this have been showing small amounts of magma were seeping into the storage area? It is possible, but only just a theory. The previous deeper events, which occurred prior to February 13, 2019, could have been small amounts of magma seeping into pre-existing dikes or sills. And the recent, more shallow ones that have occurred just in the past month or so, that could be from the gas output due to the increase in magma supply within the chamber. That theory would explain why they were deeper, occurring underneath the magma chamber, and now they are more shallow. Very interesting, guys. That is very interesting. Now, again, this is all just a theory. But look at the depths of the recent ones, though. They, you can tell there is a big change, a big, big difference. Even one occurring, uh, occurring excuse me, very close to the surface. Now, by the way, I do have um, a web page on my website about the LF events shown, on again, on this Cascade Low Frequency Events page. Um, it shows a bunch of different stuff. And remember, go to my website. Again, a link is under my email address in the description box below. Go to the Seismic Events 2 drop-down menu and click Cascades 2019 through 2019 page. Now, these LF events do not seem to be stopping, but I am relieved that they are not occurring in major swarms or coinciding with moderate to major earthquake swarms. Well, at least not yet. That could always change. Now, for those who don't know what Newberry is... Newberry Volcanic Caldera is a volcanic field and is the largest volcano in the Cascades Volcanic Arc and covers an area the size of Rhode Island, guys. Yeah, let me zoom out of this. Look at this area all the way through Bend. Look, there's Bend, Oregon all the way up. Oh, yeah, by the way, if anybody here is in Bend, Oregon right now, you are sitting on top of a volcano, literally. Look at how far it extends all the way out here and all the way down here. Very interesting. <clears throat> so, covers an area the size of Rhode Island. Unlike familiar cone-shaped cascade volcanoes, Newberry was built into the shape of a broad shield by repeated eruptions over the past 400,000 years, supposedly 400,000 years. Okay, well, how in the heck is there a shield volcano here, guys? I'm pretty sure, I thought shield volcanoes weren't supposed to even occur uh, in this part of the world, like on the west coast of the United States. I thought it was mainly supposed to be stratovolcanoes, and that's it, basically. Very interesting. Very interesting why this is uh, this volcano is here. Now, throughout its eruptive history, Newberry has produced ash and tephra, pyroclastic flows, and lava flows that range in composition from basalt to rhyolite. About 75,000 years ago, supposedly, a major explosive eruption and collapse event created a large volcanic depression at its summit that now hosts two caldera lakes, one of those lakes being named Paulina Lake. Newberry last erupted 1,300 years ago, and present-day hot springs and geologically young lava flows indicate this is still a very active volcano, which the threat potential is set to very high, which is the highest threat potential USGS has for any of its volcanoes. Composition based salt to rhyolite, and is a shield shape. Notice how they don't say that it's an actual shield volcano because it's very strange to have this on the west coast of the United States. But still, they may say shield-shaped, it's a shield volcano. It is. It shouldn't be there, but it is. Very interesting, guys. Okay, now I quickly want to talk about the Newberry Volcano Magma Chamber, which is very important to understand uh, the locations of the depths of these low-frequency earthquakes to see if we can connect any of them. And I'm not going to be able to do that in this video. That's going to take a lot of research on my part, guys. I, I'm going to try to do it. Don't know when I'll get it done or if I ever will. But I want to see the location and the depths, the hypocenters of these earthquakes, these low-frequency events, and see if they connect or coincide with any of the dikes and sills beneath the magma chamber. So I think it's very interesting. Their magma chamber is pretty large. You know, New Newberry, it's not dead, guys. It's got, it's got a good-sized magma chamber down there. So Newberry Volcano, Emily Hooft, I'll leave a uh, link to this website in the description box below. Seismic investigation of Newberry Volcano. In the summer of 2008, we deployed a seismic array across Newberry Volcano to image the magma system. Newberry is a large, recently active volcano. Characterizing the size, depth, and percentage of melt in magma, rich volume is critical for assessing the hazard posed by a volcano. We combined seismic tomography with finite difference waveform tomography to image the upper crustal magma structure. 
Now, seismic tomography combined with waveform modeling constrains the dimensions and melt of a magma body in the upper crust at Newberry Volcano. Listen to this, guys. Now, we obtain a P-wave tomographic image by combining travel time data collected in 2008 on a line of densely spaced seismometers with active source data collected in the 1980s. Remember, they did this in the 1980s and 2008. The tomographic analysis resolves a high-velocity intrusive ring complex around a low-velocity caldera fill zone at depths above 3 kilometers and a broader, higher-velocity intrusive complex surrounding a central low-velocity anomaly at greater depths of 3 to 6 kilometers. Low-velocity anomaly, basically that means a magma chamber. Basically, it's this right here. Yeah, doesn't this look like a brain tumor or something? <laughs> Very strange looking. I'll, I'll show you this picture in just a second. It will have zoomed in. Now, this second upper crustal low velocity anomaly. Now, remember, seismic waves travel slower through magma, guys. That's how they can image things. Now, this low velocity anomaly is poorly resolved, and resolution tests indicate that an unrealistically large low velocity body representing 60 kilometers cubed of magma melt. Woo! That's, that's a good amount, guys. Like, it erupt tomorrow. Now, they say that is likely not the case, but it's still, you should keep the possibilities open, just in case. You never know. Could have been imaging something maybe deeper. I don't know. I don't know. But they say it is unrealistically large, 60 kilometers cubed of magma melt, which could be consistent with the available travel, travel time. Excuse me. The 2008 data exhibit low amplitude first arrivals and an anomalous secondary P wave phase originating beneath the caldera. Two-dimensional finite difference waveform modeling through the tom tomographic velocity model does not reproduce these observations. To reproduce these phases, we predict waveforms for models that include synthetic low-velocity bodies and test possible magma chamber geometries and properties. Three classes of models produced a transmitted P phase consistent with the travel time and amplitude of the observed secondary phase and also match the observed lower amplitude of first arrivals. Okay. These models represent a graded mush region, a crystal suspension region, and a melt sill magma chamber above a thin mush region. So, guys, so we have uh, crystalline suspension, crystal suspension down there. Uh, I don't know exactly where, maybe around this area. A graded mush region, which means it's not magma, but it's not solid rock either. I believe that's what that means. And then we do have a melt sill above a thin mush region. The three possible magma chamber models comprise a much narrower range of melt volumes, 1.6 to 8.0 kilometers cubed. That can be constrained by travel time tomography alone. According uh, with Newberry, I'm thinking it's a little bit bigger. I'm thinking maybe about 8 kilometers cubed. Uh, yeah, very interesting. That's still a good amount of magma, guys. Now, here's what they imaged using those processes. Newberry Visitor Center is right over here. And we do see this is the possible conduit in a magma system. Notice the magma chamber is like below this, I guess. I don't know for sure. Uh, they really didn't image anything beneath here. But you'll see what it likely looks like beneath this magma chamber in just a second. So I think that's very interesting, guys. Newberry indeed is still an active volcano. It contains a good amount of magma. It ain't dead, guys, and I wouldn't be surprised if it became active sometime in the near future. Now, let's take a quick look at the publication that they have listed on this page. If you wish to skip this and go straight to the analysis I do of the low-frequency events at Newberry, please go to the parts section in the description box below to navigate. Now, again, a link to the previously shown page will be posted in the description box below. Again, it contains the link to this publication here. This publication titled, Upper Crustal Structure of Newberry Volcano from P-Wave Tomography and Finite Difference Waveform Modeling was written by Matthew Beachley, Emily Hooft, Douglas Toomey, and Gregory Waite in May of 2012 and was published in the Journal of Geophysical Research, Volume 117. This publication is amazing, guys. I have already read some of it, skimmed across it a few times, and will probably continue to learn from it, and I suggest you do the same if you are interested in these things. It's a great publication about Newberry Volcano. And let's take a quick look at some of their figures. Okay, so here is figure four of the publication. Now, remember, seismic waves tend to slow down. Now, keep this in mind, while... 
reading and learning about this stuff. Seismic waves do slow down when traveling through a thick, viscous substance like magma. This is how scientists can image the subsurface magma reservoir of basically any volcano in existence. Isn't that pretty cool? Waveform analysis can do some pretty amazing things. Now notice we are looking down onto the caldera, uh, south to north. So up this way is north, down this way is south. So we're looking right down into the caldera like we have x-ray vision, sort of. This shows the velocity perturbation. Perturbation. Sorry, I'm terrible at pronouncing that word specifically. <laughs> now remember, seismic waves do travel slower through magma, and they have different depth zones here. Here's at about 0 0.5 kilometers in depth. Here's uh, about 1 kilometers in depth, 2 kilometers, 3 kilometers, 4 kilometers, 5 kilometers, so on and so forth. So forth, excuse me. And the color is connected down here on this legend right here. Now let me read what they say. Depth sections through the final P wave velocity model of the tomography inversion. Velocity is colored as perturbation from the initial, what is that, 1D? 1D velocity model with 0.1 kilometers per second contours. A transparent overlay masks the velocity model where the DWS is less than 1, indicating where the velocity model is resolved, see text. I have to be honest, some of this stuff does not make any sense to me. I can understand some of it, but other things I don't much at all. Now the red lines show caldera ring faults mapped at the surface, and you can see it takes the shape of Newberry caldera. Now, where did I leave off? Major features include a high-velocity ring that follows the caldera ring faults and surrounds a central low-velocity region above 2 kilometers in depth, a much broader and higher magnitude high-velocity anomaly below 2 kilometers in depth, and a central low-velocity body below 3 kilometers in depth. In figure 4F, the region covered by figure 7 is shown by the dashed box. Very interesting. Wow. So it's got, it's got a good amount of magma down there, guys. I mean, it's not too, too crazy, but it's there. All right, and here's what Newberry Caldera looks like if we had x-ray vision looking to the, let's see, west to east, south to north. So we're looking basically towards the northwest. That's the northwest section of the caldera. Notice this Paulina Lake. These, the two caldera lakes are basically right here, guys. Uh, yeah, it, look at how big this region is underneath. 3D representation of tom tomographically recovered velocity anomalies illuminated from the southeast. The view is from 20 degrees east of south and 30 degrees above horizontal. High velocity structure is colored light blue above 1.5 kilometers in depth and dark blue below 1.5 kilometers in depth contoured at plus 0.2 kilometers per second velocity perturbation. The color difference distinguishes a possible structural difference between the shallow high velocity ring and a broader, deeper, high-velocity region. The central low-velocity body, magma, anomaly, within the caldera is not shown. Oh. Oh, I just skipped past a sentence. No wonder it didn't make sense. The central low-velocity body, this red thing right here, is colored red and contoured at negative 0.1 kilometers per second velocity perturbation from 3 to 5 kilometers in depth. So that's probably the actual amount of magma down there. So it's between three to five kilometers in depth. It's not this whole thing. This whole thing is not all magma, guys. But this could eventually someday turn into magma and erupt. The shallow low velocity anomaly within the caldera is not shown. At the surface, red lines show inferred ring fractures and black lines show 0 0.1 kilometers topography contours. Now this is what really piqued my interest. So over here is from the southwest to the northeast. So I believe we're looking northwest. I believe that's the direction that this is looking if you cut it in half. Now again, here's the surface of the Earth. Here's underground. Now here's Newberry Caldera. Now this is what is particularly interesting that relates to the low frequency events I'm going to be studying. Could the previous slightly deeper low frequency events be small amounts of magma traveling up into the reservoir through these dikes and sills that you see here? Ah ha ha. Because some of almost actually a lot of the low frequency events were occurring deeper than this region here occurring all the way down here so could it have been showing magma from a deeper much much deeper region possibly maybe i'm going to say mantle plume or from the subducting plate could it be coming through these uh sills and dikes i think it's possible i think that's what is actually happening with these low frequency events but the most recent low frequency events have been very very shallow primarily in this region right here 
So is that showing that the recent shallow low frequency events could be from gas output from the increased supply of magma and the deeper ones be from the actual rise of the magma into the chamber? I don't know, but there must be a reason why low frequency seismicity has dominated recent seismicity at Newberry Caldera. Again, I'll leave a link to this publication, actually to the website that hosts this publication in the description box below. It's very good. I suggest you read it if you're interested about Newberry Caldera. Okay, so we're quickly going to be looking at the data for the same day that these four low-frequency events occurred. Um, some more did occur, but I'm just going to focus on uh, March 31st and through April 1st. So, again, these are already confirmed to be low-frequency events by PNSN, which is the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. But once you look at the waveform and frequency content, you will realize you don't really need PNSN to tell us that. You can tell they are low frequency events. I already have the data stream added for the time periods of these events. So let's check it out in the seismic program swarm. All right, here we have the data stream from seismic station CPCO. If you follow my work or monitor these volcanoes yourself, you probably know that CPCO resides basically right in the center of the caldera. Notice as I go through the data, which I will go through it line by line to see if there are any unreported events, there are many unreported events that are obviously real seismic events, especially if you cross-correlate with neighboring stations. I'm not going to cross-correlate for the sake of time right now, but you could do that if you want to just by using the program Waves or another seismic program capable of cross-correlation. Again, CPCO is a broadband station right in the center of Newberry Caldera, overlap to 95% to rescale off, and since this is a broadband station, I'm going to do a 0.7 Hz high pass filter to the 8th power to get rid of those pesky, pesky background macrocyisms. I'm going to use the spectrogram first. So, let's go forward. Not much, not much, not much, noop, 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 some gaps in the data stream, not much, not much. Not much, a little popping here and there, don't really see much, nope, 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 and then we get this right here, but look at what this is. This is a teleseism. Let's check out the dominant frequencies, shall we? The dominant frequencies are a little bit higher than what I would expect for a teleseism, but nope, definitely a teleseism, 0.6 hertz to about 1 hertz, yeah. Way too low, I believe, in my opinion, to be an actual low-frequency event. Plus, because there are multiple telseisms during this day. Let's zoom out. Let's see. Definitely looks like a telseism. It might not be, though. Don't hold my um, don't hold me accountable to that. It might not be because it looks very strange, in my opinion. It does look very strange. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that was an uh, actual low-frequency event or something else. But let's move on. Let's table that for later. Could have been something. We do see an event right here. Right here. Right here. Okay, let's check out the dominant frequencies of this event. Shall we? Dominant frequencies rest below 5 hertz, likely making this a low frequency event. And frequencies are a little bit higher, but I highly doubt you're going to see any type of rock falls or avalanches in Newberry, since it's more of a uh, caldera than a stratovolcano. Now, I want to go back to PNSN and see, let's see, let's see, 31st at 10.15 UTC. So we're not even there yet. We're not even there to the reported LF event yet. Um, this looks like another teleseism. You can actually see it on the web recorder, the dominant lower frequencies. You definitely see that on the web recorder. Uh, let's keep going forward, keep going forward, not seeing much. There might have been something there and there, but not seeing much, not seeing much. Keep going forward. Oh! And here's an event right here. Very strange looking. Very, very strange. Let's check out the dominant lower frequencies, or the, the dominant frequencies, excuse me. Yes, this is a low frequency event. There's a tiny spike at about 7.1 hertz, but that might not be related at all. So we did have an unreported low frequency event right here. Highly doubt that any of these are explosions. I highly doubt it. Because uh, I remember um, in my video a long time ago, I did contact the nearby quarries. And they said, hey, we're not we're not doing it. It's not us. It's not us, guys. And I said, okay, I believe you. Then we have another event right here. Check this out. This one's more emergent. In my opinion, it looks more like a rock fall, but there's no reason we should be seeing multiple rock falls or avalanches in Newberry Caldera. There's no reason for that whatsoever. Uh, let's see. Dominant frequencies between 1.6 hertz and 2.7 hertz. Definitely a low frequency event. 
Don't know exactly what it was caused by, but let's see. That's a 1009. This occurred at 1015. So let's go to 1015, which is right about here. Wow, it's glitching. This is the reported event reported by PNSN to be a magnitude 0.1 low frequency event and negative 0.6 kilometers in depth. That's this one right here. Notice the striking similarity to the previous LF events during this day that I just showed. So these are obviously LF events that not many are being reported, guys. We see dominant frequencies rest between 1.7 hertz and 2.3 hertz. Definitely a low frequency event. Check out the waveforms just real quick, just because I love these events. Low frequency events are one of my favorite seismic events to analyze. I don't know why. They're just pretty cool. Very interesting. Now, let's go back to the spectrogram and let's move throughout the day. See if there's any more unreported events. Now, the next reported LF events occurred on April 1st. We're not even close to April 1st yet. So the rest of what you see on March 31st are unreported events. That might be a teleseas. I'm not sure, but it could be another low... F nope. I, no, that's definitely another low-frequency earthquake. That's definitely... The frequencies are a little too high to be a teleseism. So why is low-frequency seismicity increasing so much lately? Why is, why is it dominating the recent seismicity at Newberry? Because I, I don't know what the normal... Because normal seismicity at Newberry shouldn't be strictly low-frequency events, right? And here we see a slightly higher frequency event with a little bit higher frequencies. This looks like a, just a normal earthquake, but still does contain... Let's see, let's see... Yeah, it still contains some dominant lower frequencies. Yeah, okay. So, that's still a low frequency event occurring at Newberry Caldera. We have multiple of these events in one day, guys. Multiple events that have not been reported at all by PNSN. Only a small, small handful of these events have been reported by PNSN. Keep going forward. Little tiny, tiny, tiny guys throughout the day. Very tiny, very tiny. Uh, some of them might not be real, some of them may be real, because you don't know what's going on on the surface, guys, but you can definitely tell when something's an actual earthquake, or an actual low-frequency earthquake. You could you could pretty much tell. This definitely looks like another low-frequency earthquake. Let's check out the dominant frequencies of this event right here. I'm not even to April 1st yet, guys. Dominant frequencies rest, and why is this blocking my view? This is blocking my view. My goodness. Okay, dominant frequencies rest between 1.7 hertz. And 2.3 hertz, just like the other low-frequency event we just saw. Okay, so these are obviously real. These are obviously, obviously, excuse me, being caused by the same exact process. Multiple events throughout the day. Look, even more. Multiple, multiple, guys. Look at all these events right here. Look at this. I mean, I'm not saying every single one of them is a real low-frequency event, but let's go back to the spectrogram, shall we? Look at all those events right here. Just in this small time frame. Most of those, in my opinion, do look like real low frequency events, but they're so tiny, guys. Some of them are really, really tiny. Let's move forward, shall we? We see an earthquake with slightly higher frequencies, but still looks like a low frequency earthquake. Let's check out the dominant frequencies of this event. Dominant frequencies, 2 hertz to about 2.2 hertz. Kind of the same, but it does have weaker frequencies going a little bit higher than before. Man, you guys are really seeing the full amount of data, guys. I mean, you guys are seeing the whole shebang. Line by line. Line by line, guys. Because I don't want to miss anything. I want to be right on top of it all. We do have a higher frequency earthquake right here. Looks like a normal VT, volcano tectonic earthquake, with dominant low to mid range frequencies. That does look like a normal earthquake, in my opinion. Let's go to the spectrogram. Let's keep going forward. Don't know why that one was not reported. Then we have another earthquake right here with multiple other earthquakes. Look at this. And none of these are being reported. None of these are being reported. This one looks emergent. Looks like a rock fall, in my opinion. This kind of does. I, if they thought that a PNSN, I wouldn't be surprised. Because I that does look like a typical rock fall or avalanche. But that doesn't make any sense why they would be happening so often in Newberry Caldera. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Newberry had a little rock fall or avalanche here and there, but we shouldn't be seeing it this much, guys. It's impossible. No. I mean, maybe on a stratovolcano, but Newberry is not a stratovolcano. Here's another event right here. 
check out to see if this is a low frequency event or not. Let's check it out. And kind of. Dominant frequency is still rest between 1.7 hertz and 2.6 hertz, kind of like what we saw before. But there are some weaker frequencies going up to about, I'm going to say probably 8 hertz maximum. So let's go forward. We're not even to April 1st yet, guys. We're not even to April 1st, and we've already seen these this many events. This right here, yeah, that's definitely a teleseason. I can tell that, that's for sure. Let's keep going forward, 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 nothing. No, oh, saw a little tiny earthquake down here at about 1812 UTC on March 31st. What the heck? Okay, I just lost it. Oh, well. Oh, well. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Okay, let me push the data stream forward a little bit. All right, let's keep going forward. Almost to April 1st, guys. Almost to April 1st. So it seems like it did calm down near the end of March 31st. A couple events here and there. And most of that looks like surface noise, actually. These do not look like real seismic events, in my opinion, at all. Definitely not. Definitely not real seismic events right there. Okay, let's keep going forward, keep going forward. Now, the first one on April 1st was reported. The first low frequency event on April 1st was reported for 10.06 UTC. The next one occurred at 10.10 and then 10.14. Okay, so let's keep going forward. So about 10 UTC. Let's see, not seeing much, not seeing much, not seeing much. Keep going forward. Some tiny poppings here and there. Tiny, tiny, tiny microquakes are occurring too. We do have a few tiny high frequency microquakes. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. We see another microquake right here. Another small little puppy dog right there. Not the two major though. Let's scroll this down. Almost done with the analysis, guys. Almost done. I just wanted to make sure I got everything. I didn't want to leave anything out. Okay, scroll this up. Let's go forward. Not much, not much, not much. And then we're getting close to 10 UTC. We should start seeing an increase in events. Should start seeing an increase any second now. Oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Wow. Okay, here is the first event of April 1st. Basically the first low frequency event of April 1st. Go to the spectra plot, log power off. Dominant frequencies go down at about 5 hertz. I'm going to say that's a low to mid range event uh does not really have dominant lower lower frequencies really I and mean, it kind of does but it does go beyond five to six hertz probably going up to about 10 hertz maybe uh so i don't know what that one was but let's move forward check this out maybe pnsn labels things as low frequency if they're under 10 hertz because i thought it was under five hertz the majority of the power has to be under five hertz for it to be a low frequency event that's what I thought. Some people, do you see, the exact terminology in seismology is not exact. Especially even the term harmonic tremor is still greatly debated by some, uh, excuse me, seismologists even to this day. Okay. First reported event was at 10.06, which was the other one I just saw. Oh, oh, okay. So this was a low frequency event according to PNSN, which was a magnitude 0.2 low frequency event at 1.6 kilometers in depth. Okay, interesting. Don't worry, guys. I'm almost done. And then this one right here at about 10, 10, 30. Around 10, 10, 30. At about 10, 10, 21. It was a 0.1 low-frequency earthquake at 0.9 kilometers in depth. That's this one right here. Now let's go forward to the main course. Here is the main course. Looky, looky at this puppy dog, guys. Wow. Let's look at the first burst, which was not reported. Notice the first burst started at about 10.13 UTC. Do we see a report for 10.13 UTC? No, we do not. It's at 10.14.38. What? Huh? Why would they make it look weaker or smaller than it really is? Because if you look right here, these are obviously connected to the same process. Obviously the same exact thing going on. One causing another, probably. Okay, so this lasted a good amount of time, guys, but they're reporting this right here. It's this event that they're reporting. Notice they do look like two separate, uh, excuse me, separate events, but I believe they are connected. This is not being reported, but this is right here. Let me zoom in on the reported event. 
definitely low frequency earthquake going up to about 2000 amplitude count one of the strongest ones that we have seen for quite a while at newberry caldera let's check out the dominant frequencies on the spectra plot dominant frequencies rest between about 1.7 hertz and 2.7 hertz and go down from there wow guys good amount of low frequency events at newberry lately man so what's going on with the newberry volcano do you think that the deeper events could have been signaling magma rising through the sails and dikes into the caldera or into the uh, caldera's magma chamber? And the most recent events, which were much shallower, could be signaling possibly gas output or some hydrothermal activity? I don't know. I don't know, but let's keep going forward, shall we? Keep going forward. Now, after this part, they have nothing else reported. Nothing else reported, except we do see something right here. This does not look like an earthquake. Yeah, those do not look like earthquakes to me at all. They are emergent and have dominant high frequencies. Of course, that doesn't mean that they're not seismic, but I highly doubt they are. Not seeing really any more low-frequency earthquakes throughout the day at all. And that's basically it. So, that was very interesting. Now here we are back at the Old Faithful Geyser webcam, which resides within the Upper Geyser Basin at Yellowstone National Park in Caldera. It seems the deep, long-period, high-frequency events in Hawaii are increasing as of the past few months. Why is that? Could it be related to magma transport through the conduit that lies under that location in that depth? Also, why is Newberry Volcano, a large caldera which resides just south of Bend, Oregon, seeing so many low-frequency earthquakes lately? Low frequency earthquakes seem to be dominating the background seismicity at Newberry, making me wonder if something is changing. Of course, these have happened before and haven't led to anything. However, it is best to monitor the area closely, just in case. You never know how much magma is truly down there, or how fast it can rise and accumulate within the main chamber. There are even zones of mush around the magma chamber, which potentially could melt into actual magma from any sustained increase in heat from below. All of this stuff is very interesting, guys. I am now starting to work on my monthly volcano update, and it should be out in the next five days or so at the max. That, of course, may be drawn out just a little bit if anything concerning may occur. After all, if a large swarm breaks out of Yellowstone or Newberry or some other volcano, then I would way rather point my attention towards that for the time being. I thank you all for your constant support, and I will see you soon. Don't forget to check out the links below, including my website. God bless, and remember the truth is considered hater fear to those who hater fear the truth. Ben Ferriolo, signing off.